games are nothing without suspension and disbelief of you losing yourself in that environment. They're creating fantasy war, but even fantasy war has some resemblance to real war. If water looks like water, and rocks look like rocks, and explosions look like explosions, then you are engaged in the plot at a much more visceral level. The way that the engineers and the artists work together is one of my favorite things about Bungie. You've got these insanely brilliant mathematical types uh, that are really passionate about this new technology. There have been a lot of ideas that have started from the engineering side, where an engineer said, hey, there's this technology I know how to use, or there's this thing I think I can do. He definitely had a long-term vision about the graphics system. You know, he had some fundamental ideas early on that he thought were going to be really important. And Halo 2 had a water system that looks really good but it has a lot of limitations. It's pretty convincing from a high angle, but when you're at eye level, the effects breaks down. We were not actually rendering water as geometry. In the beginning, we'll have to do a little bit of selling. We have to say, hey, look at this cool water. It's gonna be awesome, we're gonna do weather, we're gonna do water, and the artist then gets extremely excited. The Halo 3 is based on a new platform of Xbox, so in the new generation, we make the water surface animated. You can interact with it, you can sh you know, throw things in the water, and it creates ripples, and it looks great. Probably the most fun thing about the water is that the bodies float in it. So you can shoot people and watch them float downstream. When we first began, uh, our endeavor with building interactive water for Halo 3. We had given examples of small pools of water, uh, little streams, rivers, and that kind of thing. We just freshly delivered the water, and then the water you know, happened to have ocean waves on it. What it turned out that we needed a lot more of was small creeks, babbling brooks, or rushing rivers. Water's pretty tricky. Uh, my first attempt yesterday was pretty bad. I think it's cool. <laughs> you think it's cool? Yeah. <laughs> Tell Marcus you think it's cool. <laughs> Max is complaining about it. Ocean waves and a stream? No, it doesn't work at all. You want every creation you make to be beautiful, but with limited budgets, it's hard. If you're trying to integrate some same cool things into the game engine, you have a pretty limited budget. You have to be really uh, strategic with how you plan your assets that way. So she will create a version of the water tool, and then we'll try it. There'll be some things that we want to use differently from an artistic perspective, and so we give them feedback. Our Water shader is pretty highly customizable. The artist can change the murkiness, and you also can change the color of the water. You can change the transparency and the sharpness of the wave. We also have ways for them to paint different parts of the water uh, parameters. And then the engineer looks at it and goes, oh wow, I never thought you'd be doing something like that with my system, but that's so cool looking that I want to make a better system for you to do that. And uh, nobody knew what it was going to turn out like. And then when it came time for the beta, which is when it really you know, came together, it was awesome. Pretty soon that you see water shows up in every level. So basically means if you have something cool, they'll actually go out of their ways, making sure that the technology gets used in the right way. So we're more of a partnership than, than a competition, you know, because everybody wants their level to look the best. Halo, right from the start, has always been a game about shooting people and having them die. Every different type of gameplay interaction you need in Halo needs to be implemented specifically in the damage system. Damage is kind of one of the base layers of communication between all of our objects in the game. The damage system keeps track of all of the interactions where some input is damaging some object in the world. So one thing that all the objects in the Halo world have is a bounding sphere, which is a simple representation by which we can intersect two objects. The red spheres are active objects, meaning they're actually running animations, so they're gonna take up a little more performance. The blue spheres are things that aren't running animations, but are updating, and then the yellow spheres are things that are completely inactive, and so they're passed over very quickly in, when the game's processing. So the bounding spheres are just a coarse way of figuring out what we're gonna hit. To go further, you actually need to look at their collision models. This is a set of this green geometry. When we shoot this object here, it's on that green geometry that we spawn all the sparks, and uh, it's what the projectiles actually hit. Through the damage system, we're actually permuting different parts of the object into more destroyed states. So you can see the, the tires coming off. You can see the chassis changing to more destroyed states. 
You take a look at a vehicle like the Warthog, and it's tremendously complicated to set that up. Fully loaded with a bunch of guys riding in it. That Warthog is made up of probably about 11 different objects. So when that Warthog is smoking, it's taking a lot of damage, and finally a rocket comes in, and we detect, OK, the rocket has finally struck the Warthog. What needs to happen? We look at all the different damage sections on the Warthog for hubcaps and tires and things like that. If any of them were particularly near the epicenter of the blast, then we're going to detach them and blow them off and accelerate them away. It'll, you just have this cloud of expanding objects that's now going to go flying through the air. When you sort of trace it through the game, you actually realize that the object system says, oh, well, you're actually going to destroy the vehicle that these guys are in. I need to eject them from the vehicle. Physics says, oh, well, these guys are dead. I'm going to start ragdolling them. AI is you know, making the guy scream, oh my god, we've just been killed. Since the damage being passed from one object to another is the thing that makes these cascading relationships happen. The relationship between the AI programmers and the mission designers is, is one of the key communication lines at Bungie. I think the interaction between design and engineering is that design asks for the sky and engineering delivers the earth. <laughs> because we're engineers. We are like really into doing things physically correct. In a lot of ways, what rules everything is the simulation and sort of the coherence of the sandbox. The sandbox is all of the characters, weapons, and vehicles in the game, and how they interact with each other through damage and AI and the player control. <laughs> All of the entities that are running around this world have their own rules for how they move. Everything reacts according to the laws of gravity. Things collide and they bounce off each other. Jamie's just got tons and tons of different sort of knobs and dials when it comes to physics that he can tweak that can have dramatic changes on how the warthog drives around in the environment. The green rectangles are relative velocity, so that's how the tires know how much they're already slipping. How much friction do you have when you're sliding? You know, what happens when you land nose down on a jump? Can you save it? The maximum speed that the Warthog can actually go at is a result of all kinds of really complicated sort of system interactions. How much gravity is applied to that wheel? What's the behavior, you know, on a 20% incline? Of the gear ratios of the gears that the Warthog happens to be running in at the time. These are sort of all the things that just go into getting one vehicle right. The end result is you have a world that is extremely complicated, obeys lots and lots of rules, but you're able to take advantage of it and make plans and outwit it in a certain way. Is it engineering's game or is it art's game or, you know, is it design in charge of everything? I think it's a collective decision. Trying to manage everybody's different passions and keep everybody, you know, happy and productive and working and passionate is hard. I'm sure that uh, Jamie will tell you that he owns the sandbox, and I'm sure that Damian and the engineers will probably tell you that they own the sandbox, but to me it's pretty clear that the people who own the sandbox are the people who buy the game and the people who do the kinds of creative things within that sandbox that we could never have dreamed of.